Hey guys, it's Hollow one here. Welcome back to another video. And today, yep, here we go again. So this is my uh, post-war um, Lionel Erie NW2 switcher number 8354. Um, I say post-war because uh, this locomotive was manufactured somewhere between uh, 1973 and 1975. I'm not sure where, but the post-war era ended circa 1969 so it's not technically post-war as far as from what i can deduce but uh it is a very post-war looking locomotive so i don't entirely know what to classify it as so this train has actually made it into more videos on my youtube channel than any other locomotive that i own the reason for that is because it's usually just kind of sitting on the middle track up here, up at this freight station that I threw together who knows how long ago. Um, but yeah, so when the camera's sitting here, the engine's just kind of parked up here in pretty much every single video. It's not in the thumbnails because I actually bothered to move it because I was trying to make the thumbnails look good. But yeah, and whenever I'm doing like product reviews or, or product reviews because these trains are old and nobody wants to watch a product review from a train that's upwards of 70 to 80 years old. Um, but yeah, so it's usually just kind of sitting here much like the 2035 is always sitting there and the Santa Fe F3 is always sitting there. I'm just not sure if anybody notices it. But uh, yeah, so this locomotive had a review. I'm going to be doing this a lot in this video, apparently. Um, this engine had a review years ago. Um, I don't actually know how long, but uh, it's kind of difficult to review these engines because nobody wants to buy a 45-year-old locomotive. Um, that's at its newest, is 45 years old. Uh and most of the details anyway are cast in because you know that was how they were built the only separately applied details that i can think of are uh, the horn the bell that's missing and the little red lights up at the front here um but those are uh, apart from that everything else is cast in so like it's not a very like useful review video but this locomotive does have one thing that makes it unique as compared to every other post-war locomotive that I own, and that lies under the shell. So uh, as I will do here, because the screw is so conveniently missing, I don't actually know when it went missing, but uh, it's been gone for quite a while. Um, I'm just going to like lift up the shell. And uh, if you cannot tell what makes this engine unique, then uh, you might need your eyes checked, because there's very clearly a piece of electronics in here that is not from 1975. So this is a TMCC conversion board from the Electric Railroad Company that I installed in this engine. I don't even know how long ago. I should have wrote the date down somewhere. Um, but it was a very fun install, and uh, you may notice that the E-unit's also missing. Um, I wasn't too bright when I was originally doing this, and uh, I thought the E-unit was interfering with the operation of the board. Um, here, I just had the board wired wrong. But uh, I now just have a spare E-unit sitting in that box that I'll get out in a minute because I'm not sure if I've actually shown what a e unit looks like on this channel um, but you'll definitely get to see it when I take apart my uh, T1, my Reading T1 as I have to install a new smoke unit in it because uh, things happen to the old one that I'll explain in that video um, assuming I remember to make that video because uh, I don't have a very great memory if you couldn't tell by my sporadic uploading of videos um, anyway so this board allows me to use technology from 1994 in a locomotive that was built in 1975 which is absolutely fantastic and i love to have that capability because it just it makes it so much more enjoyable to run which nothing against running trains conventionally i love running trains conventionally that's why my center loop doesn't actually have tmcc on it and i usually run conventional trains on this track anyway and all three of the power sources for my three tracks are set up for conventional control. I have the ability to make them so that it's just a switch that turns on a constant 18 volts, but I like having this because I run a lot of trains that don't have TMCC or Legacy in them, because I only have one engine with Legacy, um, like my Reading T1 that's over there, and that kind of, that, that uh, Brunswick Green Box is technically what it is. It's dark green locomotive enamel. It's Broadway Limited Imports. Um, it's an HO Reading T1 that I own. Um, I also own an HOPRRM1A uh, that I haven't actually done a video on because I haven't owned them that long, but uh, if you want to see that, 
let me know in the comments, and I will gladly do a review on it. It's just that Locomotive has DCC, and I don't have a DCC setup here. Um, I do have DCC at the train club that I'm in up at my college, but uh, I'd have to just run it on DC here, and that locomotive doesn't actually make the turns that I have. The Mountain Class does, but the D1 doesn't. Anyway, here's an E-unit. Um, I dug this out of the box. Along with, there's, there's a lot of scrap parts in there, uh, including a smoke unit that I think is out of that thing because it started shorting out the entire locomotive, and I don't know why, and I haven't gotten around to fixing it yet, but that's in there, and it technically still functions. But uh, I just need to redo the wiring at some point, which involves me taking apart that locomotive, which I don't want to really do right now. Um, but I have a ton of free time, but so I might do it. But anyway, so this is in a unit. So I'm not sure if this is an original E-unit from this engine, because this engine looks a lot more worn down for this E-unit to have this very, very shiny red electromagnet in the middle. But, uh, who knows, maybe it is. But anyway, so the way this works from what I can tell, is these red coils here create an electric field, or electromagnetic field, that pulls up this piston, which pulls up this clamp, which rotates this drum. Now this drum has little plastic parts on it that I think are what change the electric conductivity to the pins that are underneath of the barrel that tell the engine whether or not to go forward, backwards, or just not move. Um, and then this lever up here controls whether or not the coil actually gets power, which would allow it to rotate the drum. So if the coil doesn't get power, the drum stays in the same place, so it would lock it out. However, if it's getting power, every time you power up the engine, it pulls up this pin, which rotates the drum. So from what I can tell, that's how these things work. Um, why the headlight wire usually comes off of this thing, I don't have a darn clue. But, uh, it usually does. I found another one that looks a lot older. Um, I'm just, this one's missing some parts. So, yeah. Ah, so, I remembered where this came from. That little train there that's on that middle display track, um, that used to run. It took about, like, three days of me messing with that engine to make it run. But I made it run. Uh, and it did about two laps, and then the whole thing blew up. And I don't know why, but it was just going happily, and it got around there, and then all of a sudden the entire layout just started shorting out. Uh, and I couldn't figure out why. So I took the train off the track, powered it up, the layout was fine. Um, but the engine was just fried, and I could not fix it. I spent another, like, four days trying to fix it, and just couldn't fix it. Uh, but that's where this came from. Because I needed a part out of this... So there's a little plate in the bottom here that usually has, if my camera would focus, um, that usually has those little pins. And I was restoring another locomotive, and it needed those pins out of the E-unit. Uh, and I didn't really, I didn't have a spare plate, and I couldn't find one um, without just buying a whole new E-unit. So, yeah, I, I took that out, and... Uh, put it in the other one, and the other one now works. This one, I, I think this E-unit would work if it had those, that plate, but uh, I wasn't going to try and mess with it. I basically just took every single wire out of that engine, except for the one that goes to the headlight, so that when I turn on all the lights in the houses and whatnot, the headlight turns on. Um, but yeah, that's why that engine doesn't run. Okay, so this video is getting massively off topic, but uh, I found another one. I don't know why I have three of them. I'm pretty sure this one came out of the GG1 because my grandfather bought a new E-unit for it even though it didn't really need one because I was fine with it going one way. But uh, he bought me a new E-unit. So as far as I know, this E-unit doesn't allow trains to go in reverse. Um, so that's a thing. But uh, other than that, it's a perfectly functioning E-unit just like that thing is. So uh, I have two functioning E-units and one that needs a single part for just kind of sitting in that box. So, yeah, anyway, back to the train. So, installing this board wasn't too difficult. Um, I had to mount two capacitors and solder a bunch of wires uh, and then just screw wires into the board and then put the top board on top and mount the antenna. Uh, the antenna just kind of runs along the top 
Uh, I also put in directional lighting. So the headlights do actually function when going forward and reverse. Um, which this didn't originally have a reverse light. It did have a forward light that was here. Uh, but that was, it was an old Christmas bulb that somebody had managed to just smash in there. Uh, that took a little while to get out. But, I put like proper bulbs in, because I got them. Uh, so it's not a difficult install. The hardest part is finding places to mount them. Um, if you're putting this in a steam locomotive that has a, like a bunch of holes for speakers, um, like let's say it has two sets of holes for two speakers, you could just use one speaker and mount this in one of the holes for uh, another and the other speaker. Um, but finding holes is a little bit difficult because I don't like drilling them into old locomotives in case somebody someday wants to buy it, but they will only buy it with uh, all original stuff from what it had when I got it, which is why I keep that those things. There's also a lot more stuff in that box that I'm just not getting to. But um, the other difficult part is finding a place to mount the run program switch. Uh, I don't remember entirely how I mounted that there, but I think there was a hole, so I just put a screw through it, um, which is why it's only mounted on one side. But uh, it works, and that was all I really cared about. And before you ask, no, this train is not for sale. Alright, so now that about half of this video is about E-Units and the other half is about this locomotive, um, I'm going to do some running things now. I'm actually going to be running it on the loop that it usually runs on, uh, instead of the outermost loop. I could run it on the outermost loop, but I figure, you know, let's mix things up a little bit and run it on a loop that I don't usually do recordings of. Uh, I cannot remember if I ran this on the middle loop when I did the original video, because I don't look back that far, because self-esteem. Um, but yeah, that's what we're going to be doing today, and we're going to be running it with some uh, post-war freight cars, because why not? But first, because you didn't ask and probably don't care, I'm going to show you the directional lighting. So uh, I have this programmed in as engine 83 on my cab one here. Uh, so the antenna, it's it sometimes picks up and it sometimes doesn't, but uh, there you go. So that's the reverse light, and you can see it uh, very nicely illuminates all the electronics that you're not supposed to be able to see on the inside of the locomotive here. Um, and then the front headlight, it very, very slightly illuminates those little red lights. But uh, now we're going to run it. So there you have it, my Lionel Erie NW2 switcher numbered 8354 from circa 1975 with Trainmaster Command Control. Um, I do occasionally miss running this thing conventionally, but uh, having TMCC on it is a very nice thing to have, especially when you're planning on eventually having a layout that might all be TMCC. 
Um, it'll probably be the same setup that I have here with conventional controls, but uh, it makes it nice not having the lights constantly turning on and off when you're changing directions. Not that I change its direction much, but you know, it's a cool feature to have. But anyway, I am CW Hollow one and have a good day, or maybe good night in your case. See ya.